Hello, and thank you for joining the Living with Asthma webcast. Please note all participants are in a listen-only mode. Should you experience any technical difficulties, please let us know via the Q&A box on your screen. This webcast is being recorded, and it is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Cindy Kolowski. Please go ahead. Thank you, Bailey, and thank you everyone for joining us today in our last in a series of three webcasts about asthma. Today's topic will be focused on living with asthma. The American Lung Association appreciates, excuse me, appreciates the opportunity to provide these educational webcasts with the generous support of GlaxoSmithKline. Before we get started, though, please allow me to review a few housekeeping items. All right, so, whoops, bear with me. There we go. For the best viewing experience, we do recommend that you use a wired internet connection and closing any other programs or browser sessions running in the background that could cause you any issues. For the best audio quality, please make sure you have your computer speakers or your headset turned on and the volume is up so that you can hear the presenters and make sure the media player on your screen is enabled as well. On your screen, there is a box to view the slideshow presentation and the media player to view the speaker. If you have any technical difficulties or questions during the webcast, please let us know through the Q&A chat box. On the bottom left side of your screen, you will see resources that you can click on for easy access. And as Bailey mentioned, all participants are in a listen-only mode. Even though we can't hear you, we have planned a very engaging learning experience for you today. We will be answering questions at the end of the presentation, so please enter them in the Q&A box throughout the presentation as well. And lastly, we ask that at the end of the presentation, you complete our feedback form for the webcast. A link will populate for you to complete this electronically. This webcast is being recorded and will be available tomorrow and can be accessed using the same link you used to register. And now, without further ado, I am going to introduce our first speaker, uh, who is our National Senior Director for Health Promotion, Cindy Trubisky. And she is going to provide some opening remarks about the American Lung Association's response to COVID-19 and relation to asthma. Cindy, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. You get two Cindys right at the top of the hour. Um, Welcome to everybody and thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I'm happy to share with you the Lung Association's response and opportunities called the COVID-19 Action Initiative. There we go. And because this is so very uh, top of mind for everybody, that's why we're starting the top of the conversation about this topic. So this is our three-year commitment that encompasses a comprehensive approach to what our organization does best, research, education, and advocacy, and then community engagement through coalitions and, and stakeholders to address this ever-evolving situation and to prepare to address any future conditions. So we're working on expanding the Lung Association's ongoing respiratory research program and in engaging key public health messages that are accurate and science-based through education and advocacy and advancing and establishing a network to stop the future um, that we know will come after this pandemic is addressed, uh, anything in the future around respiratory conditions. Okay, so what we're doing um, is I just wanna highlight a few of these components that take up that comprehensive approach. And the first is a toolkit for communities to really adopt and in this real time uh, address the, the need for vaccines and how to do that in communities of need. So we've, we've actually worked with the Center for Black Health and Equity and the National Alliance for Hispanic Health to develop this science base, real facts for uh, real information about how to take on the COVID-19 uh, vaccine in communities that are most need. So that's information on how the body fights the disease, the COVID-19 vaccine and the accuracy about that, um, and then clinical trials and what's going on in the, in the uh, current and future. The, the guide's free for anybody to really use and activate in your community. So we do encourage that you, you can uh, download it and take a look at it. 
Uh, it's also going to be uh, translated to Spanish as well. Um, the other point that I wanted to share with you is real time is since vaccines are so top of mind currently that we have a vaccine tracker, how to and an, an abundance of information on all of the vaccines that are available in your community, uh, comorbidities and criteria and where you can get that. So that's all based on our lung.org webpage. And I encourage you to take a look at that. Okay, and one of the next highlights that really is an opportunity that I'd like to share with you is something called our COVID-19 Town Hall Series. So we've made it a priority to monitor recent developments and share new findings as they evolve to support Americans with science-based information, science-based information. There's a lot of side talk out there that is not necessarily accurate. So we want to share with you not only the information that's accurate, but also as it evolves and advances the resources that we have that you can trust. Um, the American Lung Association's virtual so through the computer, COVID-19 Town Hall Series is bringing top health experts together to raise awareness about the, the effects of COVID-19, the virus, the vaccines, and discuss the health impact of the pandemic on all Americans. So we're hosted by our national president and CEO, Harold Wimmer, and then all of our guests are live streaming through this series. And they cover topics uh, such as uh, testing and air quality, and mental health and um, learning uh, about this uh, is on a monthly basis. So the topics have rotated across the board. Um, where you can find all of our past programs that are on lung.org and they're free and they, you can view them at any time. So we do encourage you that if you find a topic of interest, please go ahead and, and take a few moments to do so. Again, they're free and they're scheduled on a monthly basis on the first Wednesday of the month at 3 p.m. Central Time, which is actually tomorrow. And our, our next town hall is really focusing yeah, on around. the last full year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Wednesday, March 17th from 3 to 4 p.m. And, and it's a reflection on the year of how we've changed so much and what's been discovered around the disease and what's coming on the forefront for treatment options and vaccina vaccination and how that works. But we're here today to talk about asthma. And so I did wanna address asthma and COVID-19. Uh, um, are people with asthma at greater risk? There's two key points that I wanted to put on this slide to give you kind of a context of, of what and how this connects up with our topic today. Um, amidst all the different varying news headlines, reports, science-based publications, like how do you make the sense of all of this? So here's down to two bullet points. Any viral respiratory infection can lead to worsening asthma symptoms. So people with moderate to severe asthma may be at higher risk for serious illness from COVID-19. That's the official statement from the CDC that we follow in guidance. But controlling your asthma may reduce the risk of complications. And then the second one is COVID-19 can affect your respiratory tract. So this makes just common sense. Causing an asthma trigger an episode with the possibility of pneumonia and acute respiratory disease. It's important to note that currently there's no evidence of increased infection rates in those with asthma. So, AKA, you don't have a higher risk of catching the virus due to asthma, and that's an important piece to recognize. So, although the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, states that patients with moderate to severe asthma could be at greater risk for more severe disease, COVID-19, the published data is really, um, to support this, is still, deter still being determined and emerging. I, um, there is one article that suggests that asthma may be, uh, people with asthma may be at a higher risk of hospitalization due to COVID-19. However, it's based on small numbers. And I did read a um, very current uh, Journal of Asthma article that was taking all of the evidence and um, indicating that people with asthma really don't have as high of a response to COVID-19, whether that's adherent, I mean, whether that's um, hospitalizations or death. And that's why you don't see it publicized or prioritized as much in the news currently. 
uh, it's lower down on the wrist. And there's three reasons that I have determining been determining this in my brain that um, really focus in on that. And one is uh, adherence. So people with asthma are really taking care of their asthma a little bit better than they have been in the past. Two is that they're they're physically avoiding going to the hospital or the emergency department if they usually use that as an opportunity for care or point of care. And the third is using I'm the appropriate precautions to stay healthy um, by washing and using masks. Excuse me for the interruption. So um, one more slide just to give you kind of an overview and taking good care of your chronic lung disease like asthma is one of the things that I mentioned that is so important. And through obtaining and maintaining good asthma control, that's the recipe for success. So I just wanna give you five things that you can do that, and to think about as you talk about asthma and COVID-19 to help control your asthma through this pandemic. So the first is really uh, about continuing to take all your medications as prescribed. Don't skimp, don't stretch them. Uh, make sure you have backup, including your controller medications, your allergy therapies, um, and follow your asthma action plan that developed by your healthcare provider or specialist. If you don't have an asthma action plan, this is a great opportunity for you to advance that conversation with your healthcare team. Number two, keep in touch with your healthcare team. Uh, if you don't have one, we need one. Start the conversation about your chronic disease, this and or other chronic diseases, and don't let your care lag. Um, if you don't feel comfortable going into the office, ask for a telehealth visit or a phone call. Uh, it works to keep the lines of communication open and to keep yourself healthy. Okay, three, stay up to date on your vaccinations, including your annual flu vaccine. Um, now is still a good time to get it. Pneumococcal vaccine is if you have that recommendation for your asthma. And um, currently, if, if you have that conversation with your healthcare professionals about the COVID-19 vaccination when uh, it's available for you. Um, and then number four is out of this five list, this is my short personal list, note and take care of your indoor air quality. So we spend so much more time, including myself right now in my home um, for work and remote schooling. So identify and avoid any of those indoor air triggers, those asthma triggers that are specific to you in your home and try to reduce them or reduce your exposure to them. And we have lots of suggestions and resources to help you do that. And number five, so make sure you have access to adequate supply of your medicines. I mentioned taking them, but you gotta have them in order to take them. This includes your quick relief medication or your rescue medication and use a meter dose inhaler with a valved holding chamber and the proper technique. So those are your spacers if you're familiar with them. Um, and then there is some consideration for the use of meter dose inhalers with spacers versus the use of nebulizers at this point to help reduce the possible risk of aerolization of the virus and or the spread of a virus. But again, have that conversation with what's best for you and your asthma action plan with your healthcare professional. So I'm gonna wrap this up by finally saying as the five things that you can do to help keep your asthma under control during a pandemic, but these are the real true things that help us get there. Rigorously follow the CDC recommendations as they evolve and move forward. You can go to lung.org and we have a great synopsis of that to reduce your risk of getting the virus itself. Uh, and in, in order to do that, you want to social distance, stay home when you can, and only uh, go out when the criteria have, have been adjusted and reopening in your community. Wear your mask. Avoid large gatherings where you might contract the virus. Get vaccinated when it's appropriate and for your case. And thoroughly and frequently wash your hands. It's so true that we need to do that on a daily basis. So just to give you a sense of what the American Lung Association is doing around COVID-19, we are all in and it is called the COVID-19 Action Initiative. And to sum that up, our goal is to save lives and support those in need. 
This webcast is a great example of addressing COVID-19 asthma and chronic disease education for you, patients and caregivers. So we're committed to adapting and expanding our offerings to meet the needs of the community across the country now and, and in the future, really. Uh, so with that being said, I thank you so much for attending today and joining this topic around asthma. We appreciate your ongoing effort to support the American Lung Association in this time with COVID-19 and every day when you start to manage and address your asthma. So with that being said, that was a lot, but I'm excited to give the presentation back over to Cindy Kay and we'll launch into our keynote speaker. So thanks for your attention and for coming today. Thank you so much, Cindy. Lots of good information. Hopefully uh, our attendees got some nuggets to take away. Um, and now without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce to you our featured speaker. Alicia Griffith is a registered nurse and patient engagement liaison for GlaxoSmithKline Pharmaceutical Company. She graduated from the University of Tennessee at Chattanooga with a bachelor's degree in nursing and psychology and began her nursing career over 30 years ago. She has worked in many patient care capacities, the most recent in the pharmaceutical industry for 17 years. Her passion for well-being of all people drives her to work tirelessly to positively impact those she encounters. She believes each opportunity to teach, listen, and exchange knowledge is an opportunity to help improve a life or lives. Her desire is for each of us to be our best authentic self. Welcome, Alicia. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you so much for having me. I am so looking forward to today's talk. Uh oh, we moved fast. There we go. Uh, to today's Thank everyone for coming out for the Living with a, uh, Lupus presentation today. Uh, as Cindy said, I'm Alicia with Glaxo, been an RN for more than 30 years. And so with that said, I would just like to remind everyone that th this presentation does not take the place of speaking to your physician. If you have any questions about your health condition or treatment, I would like uh, to remind you to refer all those questions back to your physician. And so with that, um, let's talk about what we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about the impact of asthma. We'll talk a little bit about uh, your asthma knowledge through doing a little pop quiz, if you will. Then we'll talk about being a goal getter and goal setting, partnering with your physician, and then we'll wrap it up by talking about practicing self-care. So in my slide, hmm. Okay, I don't know if this is gonna populate correctly, but I'll, I'll go forward, let's see if it does better. Let's go back one. Okay, so it immediately starts changing, but um, as an RN, I often think about, when I'm thinking about asthma patients and the experiences that they have when they're having an asthma attack or feeling and the expressions that I often see on their face are expressions of fear, a uh, little anxiety that you that I may be able to see from that. Uh, definitely a period of stress and, and sometimes feeling just insecure in regards to whether or not they're going to make it through this particular incident. And as caregivers, if there happen to be any caregivers on here, I often, often see on their look when their loved one is experiencing my attack, a feeling of this is a burden and how can I help? I feel like um, I, you know, you as a caregiver is not quite able to, to be there and you feel kind of dark and lost about what you can do to help get them out of this situation, which all is something that leads to frustration. So hopefully with today's talk today, we'll be able to move forward uh, when you think asthma and having the as uh, starting to feel bad from your asthma. Maybe we'll be able to give you some information that will help you head off some of those attacks and where you feel a little more confident. Uh, you feel like you have the resources that you need. You feel like your asthma is in control instead of out of control and that you can feel a little more relaxed and looking forward to your day-to-day -day activities. As a caregiver, I hope to give you a little bit more hope 
uh, help you feel that you are prepared, to help you feel that you have the resources available to you to support your significant other during this time period. So I'll go forward and talk a little bit about the statistics with lupus, uh, I'm sorry, with asthma. And when we talk about asthma, um, you ask the question, False question. Asthma affects over 25 million people in the United States. And of course, we know that asthma does affect uh, that many people. And that is a true statement. We also asked the question, uh, uh, asthma symptoms include difficulty breathing, coughing, tightness of breath and short uh, tightness of the chest and shortness of breath. And we know, too, that all of those are classic symptoms of an individual having an asthma attack. We know there's a true statement too when it comes to nighttime uh, awakenings. Asthma can result in nighttime awakenings and all of these uh, are true statements so far and we know that it leads to us trying to determine or the physician determining what is your severity level. And one way doctors categorize severity level is by how well symptoms uh, respond to the treatment. So we know that's a true statement. And we look at that response through whether it's intermittent or persistent asthma that the physicians are treating. When we talk about um, Persistent asthma, we know we have three levels of persistent asthma, and that being mild persistent, moderate persistent, and then you look at severe. And then the last question that we have here, is it true or not that severe asthma symptoms can lead to life-threatening attacks during which symptoms worsen all at once? And we know that that's a severe asthmatic attack, and that's true. So having all of those things in mind, knowing that uh, what the symptoms look like when you have it, whether you're having persistent, moderate, severe, or mild asthma. These are all things that we want to get in control. And that's why we said, let's be a go-getter. And when we talk about being a go-getter, we're talking about getting your asthma in control and setting goals that help to do that. And sometimes we have to start with little goals. Uh, one of the little goals that you may have if you're having severe asthma or your asthma is out of control is something as simple as being able to walk up the stairs without wheezing. And we may you may want to set that as your goal of the day. And then once you progress from having the goal day by day, you may be able to progress to a monthly goal or even a six months or an annual goal. And the example of that may be for you to not having the asthma attack that's severe enough for it requires an ER visit or a hospitalization might be another example of you being able to be a goal go getter and set some goals. The main takeaway here is you want to make Point to talk to your doctor about what your goals are for your asthma so that you can achieve the things in life that you want to achieve, that you can have as close to a normal life that it is possible to have. And part of being able to do that is for you to partner with your physician. And I know partnering is maybe not a term that you're accustomed to referring to when you think of your health care providers, but partnering with your physician is key. And a part of you being able to partner with your physician is preparation. And when I talk about preparation, I'm talking about preparing by knowing what you need to know about your asthma, knowing how asthma is impacting your life on a daily basis, knowing what your triggers are and being prepared to share those with them, knowing what your individual goals are, and maybe already having a list of what those goals are before you get to your physician's office, along with a list of questions that you may have had since the last time that you were able uh, talk with your physician about your condition. And always being ready to have clarity, you know, seek clarity uh, and having follow up questions. So, keeping all of these things in mind are very important when we talk about partnering with your physician. And in addition to that, we look at what are the next steps. In nursing, we always say if it's not written, it's not done. And that's one of the terms that we use, uh, a nursing term that we use. A lot of times in life, that's true, too. If we don't write down our goals, we usually don't accomplish them. And so one of the things that we want to talk about is an asthma action plan. And when we talk about the asthma action plan, we think of it as a traffic light. You have a green light means go, that everything is smooth, you're headed 
direction in which you want to go. You have the yellow zone, and that's when you have caution in the yellow zone. That means that something has changed, that your uh, breathing uh, is not where it should be. And that is of that is a big concern concern to you. So what do you do when you're in the green, you're taking your medication that's prescribed to you on a regular basis, and you are going about your way. When you're in the yellow zone, that means that you've got to make a change. You might need your rescue inhaler. Uh, you're having shortness of breath is what the yellow zone may tell you. You've had a change in your condition, your status. Uh, usually there are symptoms that shows up that show you that, and you make adjustments in your medication. And one of the things, too, when you get to the red zone that you don't want, uh, you want to know in the red zone whether or not this is a situation that requires an ER visit or you can, can you call your physician and get a medication to turn you around. Uh, so having that asthma action plan is, is very important to have. With the asthma action plan, the importance of helping you meet your goals, um, it's, it's so important for your physician to help you, help you meet your goals. The action plan also ensures that everyone is on the same page, meaning that uh, your healthcare team and your family members, if you are taking a child to a daycare, they understand what's, uh, what the expectations are. You are on the same page as you know when you need to make an emergency room visit versus you can call your physician. And as I just spoke of, if you have a child, you can share this asthma action plan with their school, their aftercare program. And even if you're leaving them in the care of a family member, this is a very important tool for everyone to understand what to do in the case that your child has an asthma attack when they're in someone else's care. Um, all of these are reference points for you to check in periodically to make sure that the asthma is being controlled and if you need a visit. So we're going to talk, um, we've talked about the asthma action plan. That is the first tool that we've talked about. But also, let's talk about tracking the symptoms and the asthma journal. Asthma uh, journaling is so very important because you're able to track all your symptoms. You're able to um, or document your symptoms so that when you have a physician's visit, you can follow up and let them know these are the challenges that, that you're having in regards to a day to day, um, the day to day activities with, with your asthma. With working with your doctor, he helps you. Um, Spot when you're having symptoms, if there's a pattern there. Uh, by documenting on the asthma journal, if you can see every day, uh, early morning or afternoon, you're particularly becoming short of breath, you may be able to tie it to what your triggers are uh, or what you're doing exactly that is causing you to have these symptoms. It enables you also to communicate the impact of your symptoms to your physician. Um, in addition to keeping this asthma journal, it keeps a record of whether your of what your old symptoms are and also if there's any additional new symptoms that you may be having. It gives you something to share with your nurse, your doctor, another part of that documentation. And it also it's also a great way to remember what's happening because Let's um, think seriously. Can we remember from day to day all the symptoms that you're having? I know that we think we can when we're having them on that particular day. But if you're having several days of an exacerbation, you're not going to be able to remember whether it started on Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday. And you want to make sure that you're able to give accurate information so, so that you are partnering with your physician and you're able to get the care and set the goals that you need to set. You want to make sure that you're taking the medication that your, your physician is prescribed to you as prescribed. And the key takeaway here, too, is not only taking it as prescribed, but also even when you feel better, a lot of times we think we can kind of back off of that medication. But with asthma especially, you can't. You've got to continue to take your medication as prescribed. And the easiest way for you to do that is to establish a routine. Do you take it in the morning at a certain time and again in the evening? Establishing that routine of when you're taking your medication and putting it on a particular schedule and taking advantage of some of the resources that we have at our fingertips, such as our cell phones. We can set a time and a, 
and in our phones every day to go off and remind us it's time to take a particular medication. One of the things that we want to also be aware of is keeping an eye on our dose counter. We don't want to get down to our last dose and then remember that we want that medication, we need additional medication. We need at least five to seven days to reach out to our physician's office so that they call in that refill and they can evaluate whether you're requiring a refill too often if it's not your regular medication. And so a lot of times we ask the question, uh, amongst my colleagues anyway, what is the why behind the why? Meaning, why are we doing what we're doing? Why did your physician prescribe that medication? What is that medication that he's prescribed to you doing for you? You want to leave, before you leave that office, you also want to know that whatever he prescribed for you, that you're going to be taking it correctly, and especially if it's an inhaler. Have someone to demonstrate to you the correct technique for using your inhaler and how you can take that, how you know if that medication that you're taking, if it's working, how long should it take before you expect for it to be working? And then also in addition to that, when would be, when would be an appropriate time for you to consider a different therapy if you're not accomplishing the goals that you anticipated accomplishing being on that medication? So that's two tools that we talked about. Now let's talk about the third tool that's available to you, and that's the doctor's discussion guide. Here, again, you can document questions that you have. You can document the medication that you're on. You can document many, many different um, questions that you have for your physician, including when the question comes up, is it time for you to see a specialist? If you have that question, always feel that you, again, are a partner in this relationship, and it's a question that you need to ask your partner, i.e. your health care provider. Do you need to see an allergist? Do you need to see a pulmonologist if your asthma is not being controlled? I want you to remember that you are your greatest advocate. You want to learn as much as you can about your asthma, organize your questions in advance so that you can share them. You want to make sure that you get to all of your appointments and you get out of all of your appointments what you want to get out of it. And using the tools that we've talked about here is a good way to do that. So we're going to move towards wrapping up, and I'm going to talk a little bit now about practicing self-care and the importance of you taking care of you. And uh, I know that I can't see you guys, but I, I would like for you to think through, are you practicing self-care? And why is self-care important? We know that we've got to find a way to de-stress. We've got to find a way to take care of our mind, our body, and our soul. And that is something that we need to commit to each and every day. And there's so many things that we can do to do that. But slowing down enough to notice the little things about yourself that may be causing stress, being kind to yourself is so important. Self-care starts, here it says self-care starts every time, uh, everything that you do once you leave your physician's office. But I would even say that self-care starts by you even going to your physician's office physician's office, taking care, care enough to go and be seen by, by a physician and know that someone is managing that part of your care. Being able to put yourself first is not a selfish act. In fact, it's an act that allows you to be able to help take care of others by putting yourself first. One of the ways that we practice self-care is through our nutrition. What we put in fuels our body and helps us to repair, helps us to be taken care of. So are you maintaining a healthy weight is a question that comes up. You know, and a lot of times we talk about physically fit, but being realistically, being realistic about it, very few of us are going to be our 18-year-old figure, you know, but you may be able to maintain a healthy weight Eat a balanced diet. Make sure that you're balancing your diet with healthy fruits and vegetables. And if you need supplements, talk to your doctor about health supplements. And then we also look at practicing self-care through relieving stress. I would like for you guys to with me now take a good deep breath in. 
and blow it out. Did you feel how much tension was released just through stopping and taking a good de- deep breath in, having that pause and release it? That's just one way of practicing self-care. The other is through meditation, through yoga classes, and even, even again, through health journaling. I call it expressive writing. You can call it, uh, and it can you can use expressive writing in addition to health journaling and making sure that you're writing down important things to you. Always talk to your doctor before starting any type of exercise to determine what's right for you. So we know we need to exercise. Uh, But when we talk about exercise, let's plan something that's realistic for where you are. And I know being asthmatic, a lot of times you feel very limited in your exercise. But you can start slow. Your warm-up may be just a five-minute walk around your house. you got to remember, too, when you go out in the cold, you want to make sure that you cover your nose and your mouth so that you're not breathing in cold air, which could possibly trigger and uh, a bronchial spasm and an asthma attack. So we want to make make sure we're paying attention to the little things that can turn into a big thing. One of the things that I learned, too, in newer cars now, they are uh, putting in air quality control or air filters in there that you can control the air quality. So if you live in an environment that you know you have a lot of pollutants in your air and you possibly could own a vehicle, that uh, helps to control the air quality, that would be quite helpful to you also when it comes to controlling um, your exposure to what can be your triggers. So even though exercise, again, is an asthma trigger, it's something that we need not avoid. We may have to start by little increments, but it's important to start uh, some type of exercise and to maintain that. And finally, we get here, we know that sleep is restorative. We've got to have it. Uh, it would be great if we could have at least eight hours of sleep. Sometimes that's not realistic. But setting that as a goal, as a goal will help you get closer uh, to having that. And some of the things that you can do to help you accomplish that is avoid watching TV at night or bringing electronics to bed with you. You want to make sure that you're not eating a big hearty meal that sits on your stomach. So instead of your body repairing itself, it's working to digest that food. And also, having a cooler room versus a room that is warm will help you with that sleep, uh, help you remember that you want to set up for a calm environment. And so I'm going to wrap up by saying there's lots of resources out there, and here are a few of those resources that are available to you. Of course, you have the CDC, Manage Your Asthma. Uh, American Lung Association also offers many patient resources and uh, videos that are available. Asthma and Allergy Foundations are available. And then in addition to that, you have the uh, National Institute of Health that has resources that are available also for your asthma. Again, you can take action, and you can take that action through being a partner with your health care provider, knowing uh, what your asthma action plan is and following it. Going to our asthma.com webpage, there's a lot of resources that are available there also. And then just remembering, you have full support. There are support groups available for asthmatics, and if you're able to tap, tap into those resources, that is great also. So I thank you. I apologize for the interruptions that we've had today, and I'll kick it back to you, Cindy. Thank you so much, Alicia. That was such good information, and I'm sure a lot of good information that people are taking away uh, to learn from today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to excuse me introduce you to our guest speaker, who was gracious enough to join us to share a little bit about her asthma story. Uh, Jolene, uh, otherwise known as Jojo O'Neill, is an on-air radio host and has been since 1984. She has been an asthma patient since 2004. Over the years, she struggled with understanding her lung disease and spent many years in and out of hospitals and emergency rooms. Along the way, she continued to ask questions with many doctors, seeking answers to managing her symptoms and getting her asthma under control. From years of asking questions and learning what specific type of asthma she was diagnosed with and what treatment options are available, her symptoms are now well managed and under control. Jojo continues with her mission to help other asthma patients 
better understand their options and learn ways to manage their symptoms as well. And now I'm going to hand it over to Jojo. Thank you so very much. I appreciate it. And I'm just excited to be here. Um, a big, big thank you to the American Lung Association and GlaxoSmithKline for this opportunity, uh, just for me to share a part of my living with asthma journey. Um, it used to be a real battle to breathe for me uh, several years ago. As a matter of fact, I plan to use that as the title of a book. I do plan to get around to writing that one day, Battle to Breathe. But uh, in my case, as Cindy mentioned in the intro, my diagnosis came when I was 40. Shortly after I turned uh, the age of 40, I'm still exploring whether or not that has uh, something to do with uh, my family history, because it seems that all of my siblings, the lung diseases that we have, they all kicked in after the age of 40. Um, but that's something else I'm looking into. So yeah, it was adult onset asthma in my case, and I never had any medical issues prior to that. All my life, I've been very active, uh, energetic uh, until that year that I developed what I thought was just a, a cold. You know, there was a little chest congestion along with the usual cold symptoms, you know, the runny nose and the, the stuffiness and the cough. But when those usual cold symptoms went away, the chest congestion remained. And not only did it remain, it increased. And so over time, I got to a point over a series of about four or five months where I could barely move or breathe um, I had no idea what was going on. I was forced to consult a doctor at that point. Uh, and after extensive testing and lab work, um, he diagnosed me with asthma. I was completely ignorant as to what that meant. I mean, I'd heard that word. It's a familiar word, asthma, but I never really knew uh, anything about it. Just people with asthma, I thought, did they just people who have trouble breathing? That was about all I knew. I took my breathing for granted until I could no longer do it very well. And so once diagnosed, uh, the struggle began. I struggled with controlling those symptoms. And that was because there was just a lot that I didn't know, a lot that I didn't understand. I uh, didn't realize that you need to medicate or treat, take treatment every day. I just thought it was, I'm gonna treat the symptoms and then I'll be okay. I don't have to take anything else. And then next thing you know, I'm right back in the doctor's office. Um, what I did know, I didn't know a lot, but what I did know was that I wanted to continue leading my active lifestyle. You know, um, I'm a fitness fanatic. Uh, one of my hobbies was entering bodybuilding competitions. Um, and I knew that asthma was interfering with my way of life and with the things that I wanted to do. And I refused to live that way. And so I began to do research on my own. In addition to working closely with my doctor, any information that I found on my own, I always made sure that I ran it by my doctor. Um, what, what was asthma doing to my body? Why was this happening? What type of treatments are available to me? Just being really open and honest, creating that dialogue with my doctor, sharing information that I'd found, uh, whether it was through the internet or through asking other people or even other you know, medical experts, you know, I would run it by my doctor. And at the same time, I noticed, um, I was just seeing a primary care physician at the time. And what I noticed was that I really wasn't getting a whole lot of background information on asthma from my doctor uh, on how to avoid all the, the asthma episodes that I was going through. Um, and so then, and, and I asked if, if there was uh, some other type of doctor that I could see. And, you know, he insisted that, you know, he could treat it there at his office. And again, I, I refused to live that way. And so I went out on my own. I did not get a referral from my, my primary care. I went out on my own. Uh, to find the type of doctor that I needed. This, this is how ignorant I was of asthma. I had no idea what you even call the type of doctor that helps you with your breathing. And that's exactly what I Googled. <laughs> the type of doctor helps you with your breathing. And so I realized that I needed a specialist. I needed a pulmonologist. So I, uh, I looked up uh, a pulmonologist, got a referral, a recommendation from one of my other doctors. I was like, who do you recommend as a pulmonologist? And they all kind of came up with the same name. So Pulmonologist, how do I live better with this asthma diagnosis? Um, I was having exacerbations. We're talking every every two to three months. The most I go is maybe five, six months. And that was going a long time without having an asthma episode. Um, spent a lot of time in and out of the hospital, just struggling to breathe better. And up until that point, I still 
had not been given any details as to the specific type of asthma that I had. Now, let's face it, I had no idea at the time that there were different types of asthma, just back to the ignorance, you know, but I, I kept on and kept on. During one of my many hospital stays, they performed a lung biopsy. And through that um, piece of uh, lung tissue, they were able to determine that uh, it was eosinophilic. And so those types of white blood cells were overproducing in my lungs. And I still, you know, kept going, kept doing my own research and consulting with my doctors and asking questions, struggling uh, and suggesting other treatments. You know, Doc, what can we try? What's next? You know, this is not working, you know? <laughs> so I eventually connected with an allergist. Again, I went out on my own and says, let me try an allergist. I actually met an allergist. And I said, hey, maybe I should come and see you. And so uh, I've been with that doctor ever since, uh, exploring uh, what's uh, triggering the symptoms. Um, my allergist is actually the one who finally began to try a certain type of medication that specifically targets those eosinophils. And I am actually still on that medication to this day. Uh, I'm doing great. No more exacerbations and no more sleepless nights. Uh, no more missed days at work. Uh, no more hospital visits and hospital stays. They knew me on a first name basis. I'd go to, <laughs> to the emergency room for, for asthma symptoms and they had all my information. They were like, oh, okay, you're back again. They knew me well. All of the doctors, nurses, respiratory therapists. Um, so my asthma journey began, as Cindy mentioned, in 2004. It took until 2017 for an effective treatment for my symptoms to be found. Um, so that's a long time. It, it, it's been a long time and at times a very scary journey. But along the way, I learned to work with my doctors uh, to find what works specifically for me because that across the board blanket treatment, it doesn't work for everybody. You have to get real specific with that. And so I've learned a lot and there's, there's always so much more to learn. Some really good information today. Alicia, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation and information, I learned a lot. And I, I learned every time I zoom in on one of these webcasts or even participate, I learn even more. One of the things that I learned <laughs> over time was that I had to be honest with, with my doctors and just tell them how I was feeling, uh, tell them you know what wasn't working well for treating my episodes. You know, it, it became more of a partnership in I had to share parts of my life and my lifestyle that might help them find a better treatment for me and help with a better diagnosis. Was I really taking the meds uh, properly, the way that they prescribed? You know, was I washing my linen in hot water to kill those dust mites that I'm allergic to that I found out over time? Was I changing those filters regularly in my air conditioning unit? So uh, I had to do my part to, to help my doctors treat me effectively was I doing that? There were times where no, I wasn't. And so I had to, you know, I had to uh, just do better on my end. Um, along the journey, uh, I've been able to connect with other asthma patients and their families. And I actually founded a 501c3 nonprofit organization called the Let's Kick Asthma Foundation. And we focus on asthma from the patient's perspective. We provide education, outreach services to meet the asthma patient's very unique needs uh, we have a monthly support group meetup. Uh, we feature special guests to help educate us on lots of different topics as they relate to asthma, nutrition, exercise, mental health, which is one thing that we uh, asthma patients have dealt with uh, during this whole COVID pandemic. You know, we already know what it feels like to struggle to breathe. And so now you're telling me that there is a, a virus out there that attacks the respiratory system? I had to bring in a, a psychologist and a therapist on more than one occasion to just talk us through this. But overall, we focus on asthma education and we get a lot of information from the medical community as well. Um, our outreach program, we help the uh, asthma patients who may be struggling financially because of too many missed days at work. Maybe they don't have any more time off available. They've used all their vacation days and you know maybe they're not, they're not able to afford the uh, medication that they need, you know, or because of exacerbations, they may not have the energy to clean their house or run those errands. And, and that's where our Let's Kick Asthma Foundation kind of steps in and, and we advocate for the asthma patients and kind of meet whatever their specific needs are. So, you know, asthma, asthma robs, uh, robs us of a lot of things. And so we uh, 
like to try and help people learn ways to live and breathe and function better. And we collaborate with our healthcare professionals and we come up with a very detailed and specific treatment plan for whatever type of asthma uh, they've been diagnosed with. We, we encourage them to, you know, this Let's Kick Asthma does not take the place of your relationship with your doctor. If anything, you need to become more involved with your doctor because now you know how important that is. But um, you can find Let's Kick Asthma on, on uh, Facebook and Instagram. We're also on letskickasthma.org. We have a website, just finding answers on how to live healthier and more productive lives. But personally, I still think that asthma is overlooked and a bit taken for granted by the public in general, which is one of the reasons why I decided to uh, just become a spokesperson for asthma education. You know, I am a radio personality by profession and a social media influencer, but uh, I decided to use those platforms uh, to help educate the general public about asthma and just how serious this condition can be if not treated and handled properly. So again, I'd like to thank GlaxoSmithKline and the American Lung Association for this opportunity to join in on this webcast. And I just applaud your efforts in uh, getting this vital information out to everybody. And I hope that through sharing my story, you know, other asthma patients will be motivated to, you know, continue that fight to get to their point of uh, living symptom free. And for those who are already there, you know, I encourage you to share your stories too, because you never know, you just might make a huge difference in someone's life. Uh, you might motivate them to interact more with their doctor or be more proactive in finding a treatment plan that's right for them. So don't let asthma control your life. So in closing, I'll just share the phrase that we like to use in our Let's Kick Asthma Foundation. Until we meet again, just breathe. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Cindy? Thank you so much, Jojo. Always a pleasure to have you and great information. I'm sure that our attendees will take away and take to heart. Uh, we have just a few minutes left, so I'm going to quickly run through the next few slides. Um, what you see here on your screen is a list of resources that is available through the American Lung Association. I won't go through each one in detail, but basically, if you visit our website at lung.org slash asthma, you can find all of these resources. Um, most of them are available through the patient and provider resources and videos, a link um, or section of the website. But we do also have a couple of things I would like to point out. The My Asthma Control Assessment Quiz is a great way for you to go and answer a few questions to see if your asthma is in control or not. This is um, information that you can then take and download the results and bring to your doctor to talk about getting control of your asthma. Really quick and easy interactive tool. The additional tools that are here um, are downloadable in PDF format. Again, uh, getting ready for that office visit to prepare you to talk to your doctor about your asthma and getting control. Um, there's an asthma medication schedule as well so that you know exactly when you should be taking your medication so you don't miss anything. The asthma action plan that was reviewed by Alicia as well. Um, in addition to a shared decision-making tool to help you have that conversation and have a joint conversation with your doctor about finding the best treatment for you. Next slide. Now in support of uh, asthma and wanting to connect with people like yourselves who have asthma, we do have an online support community called Inspire and there is a dedicated page called Living with Asthma. You can see it there with a link on your screen as well as in your resource box, there's a link for the Inspire community. This is a safe place where people with lung disease can connect for health and wellness support. In addition, uh, Living with Asthma is one of the online communities uh, for support and community discussion. Next slide, please. In addition to that, we also have our Better Breathers Network. Uh, we actually have Better Breathers clubs that are in person, but since we've transitioned to, uh, obviously as a result of the pandemic, to doing things uh, not in person or virtually, our Better Breathers Network is a great place that you can visit to connect with other people and get information about this chronic lung disease uh, that is asthma. Membership is free. Um, it's available nationwide. This is for patients and caregivers. Um, and it's just a great way to connect and get educational information and have a discussion within the asthma community um, as well. So it's an alternative to um, in-person groups. And again, you can click on that link to join the Better Breathers Network. Next slide, please. And lastly, we have our Lung Helpline. Um, so this is available daily, including weekends, and our Lung Helpline is staffed with experienced and knowledgeable registered nurses, 
respiratory therapists, and certified tobacco treatment specialists to provide clients with immediate, clear, and accurate lung health and disease information. Lung disease um, health topics include asthma, COPD, lung cancer, just to name a few. In addition to education, our specialists also help connect patients or caregivers to national, local, and online education systems, support groups, providers, and medical equipment resources. They also provide counseling for tobacco cessation. Clients can visit our website to submit a chat online or by calling our toll-free number 1-800-LUNG-USA for assistance. Next slide, please. And again, I want to thank all of you for participating in today's webcast and as well to our presenters. At the end of the presentation, there will be a feedback form that will automatically launch on your console. We do appreciate your feedback um, so that we can continue to bring you helpful and education, educate, excuse me, educational webcasts in the future. I do want to thank our presenters today, Cindy Trubisky, uh, Alicia Griffith and Jojo O'Neill, uh, thank you so much for your time and sharing your expertise and personal experiences with us. Next slide. And uh, at this time, I do uh, want to see if there's any questions, and I'm going to take a quick look here. I know we are a little bit over time. Um, and actually, we don't have any questions in our Q&A chat box. Um, I did get a positive feedback for a great presentation, and we do appreciate that feedback as well. Thank you so much for joining us. And as a reminder, if you would like to go back and view this webcast, you can do so by using the registration link that you registered with. Thank, thank you so much for your attendance today. Have a good rest of your day.